On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Ian Emit. He is the Chief Security Officer at Sempris. And uh, he's actually coming back to talk to us about a different topic today. We're going to be talking about the mental health challenges that exist. And specifically, he's in security. We're going to talk about the security side of things. Ian, thanks for coming back and talking to us this week. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me again, Amir. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've never done work in security. I've you know been a part of meetings that included security people. I apologize in advance. <laughs> exactly. It's very complicated. It seems very difficult. But most importantly to me, I always looked at the security teams and I was like, can you sleep like, you know, you literally have a job where everyone on earth is always seemingly trying to undo and find that one little gap and uh, seems like a lot of stress. It is. And uh, I don't think that anyone going into a security job expects it to be kind of a desk jockey, you know, nine to five, I'm going to drop the pen and go home and kind of forget about work. So yes, the gist of it, it is potentially stressful. You're always feeling like you're swimming upstream. And even if you take care of a lot of issues and you're, you're making progress and you're showing that you've addressed a lot of problems, all an attacker needs is one glitch, one mishap, one you know, small thing, and the hundred or thousands of things that you fixed and you addressed don't really matter. So yeah, there's a lot of potential for frustration and stress there. So I guess, you know, a lot of jobs, you can put the pen or the keyboard away and go home and come back tomorrow and continue and, and so on and so forth. You just described, obviously, as most people probably just assume with security, that it's unending. How do you personally, maybe we should just talk about you because obviously you've been in security for a long time, but how do you balance that? Like, obviously, it seems like a lot of, from an outsider, it seems like it'd be a lot of mental strain on having to always think that I need to be on. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a huge concern for me personally. I'm always trying to kind of gauge and figure out, have I taken this too far? For me, I love what I do. So, you know, that's one part that definitely reduces the stress because I am, you know, I'm, I truly love what I'm doing here. In security, I love what I've been doing for the past 20, 25 years. I find it challenging. I always keep me on my toes. I need to learn all the time. It's exciting. It's dynamic. Great. So that's one part that kind of alleviates the stress pressure thing. The second part is, and I kind of alluded to it before, but it sounded very negative. You can do a great job and you're going to always be remembered for the one thing that you forgot or you didn't do or you weren't even tasked with or you didn't know that exists that an attacker takes advantage of. And in security, you do have to, in some terms, accept it, accept the fact that especially defensive work is very ungrateful. It's about doing the best that you can and that you know. You're never going to be 100% secure. You know, Ask any security professional if they can secure your X. Their first answer should be, I can help you, I can work with you, but it's never going to be 100% secure. Some areas or some industries are always striving for that 100% and try to get, you know, and, and just like everything else, you know, that last percent, the last half percent is going to cost you fortune to get there. And the real question is, you know, are you able to do that calibration to say, you know, what industry am I operating in? What are the real goals here? You know, we all need to accept the fact that there's always going to be someone bad that wants to do harm to my business. As a security professional, your job is to make their job as hard as possible, but you're never going to be able to make it impossible. There are so many factors that you have to accept that are out there that you don't have control over. A lot of those factors, by the way, and we're talking about the human factor here, are humans. All right. Again, if you ask any security professional, yes, I can probably secure a system you know, very, very well from a technical perspective. But the second that you give that system to a user, that's it. It's game over. <laughs> you know, it's much easier to game a human than to game a machine or a system. So, you know, kind of accepting that and understanding that is sort of what allows me to, you know, not literally or figuratively drop the pen at five and kind of get back to family and life. But it does allow me to say, I know that I'm doing the best that I can. I know that I am trying to be as aware and informed as possible on my business environment and what's going on there. And I know that I have a good team with me and behind me that can pick this up. You know, if we are trying to operate on 24-7 or, you know, kind of follow the sound or whatever it is, 
I know that I do have a good team that also have a good work-life balance who can peak where my valleys are, all right? So when I am going to sleep, when I am going on vacation or have some family time, I know that someone else is ready to kind of take the helm and respond to something. And I think that that's what really allows me to get that balance, to be able to, you know, take the load off, decompress a little bit, know that, no, the world's not going to end if something happens. You know, oftentimes realizing that the difference between me responding in two minutes and me responding in two hours is not that impactful. Sometimes it is, but nothing is really critical unless it is critical. So again, having some calibration to the risk level, to the importance of things, to the business environment is what I think allows me to balance that work versus life. I guess when you're looking at this, the maturation of it, right? Like, I mean, as you're going through your career, you're starting to be able to determine how severe that issue is, right? Like now you understand something that you could wait two minutes on, two hours on How much of that's just maturation and just having learned it the hard way? There's definitely a big portion of that that's just experience. There's a lot of that. Mm, I've seen that before, right? I know where this is going, or I know that I can finish my meal <laughs> and, you know, kind of confidently get back to my laptop and connect in an hour or 40 minutes. So yes, there's a big part of that. And also being able to rely, and I mentioned the team before, on other people, on other people's experience. I'm not expecting everyone to come fully baked with 20 years of experience behind them. But even my junior analysts and engineers have experience in a particular set of topics. And I often kind of defer to them and ask, like, how serious is this? I'm not an expert on all topics. I haven't seen everything. So being able to have kind of a peer review calibration of the severity and the prioritization of issues is definitely a big part of that. So when it comes to those junior people, I mean, I guess the question would be is how do you help them understand that they need to know their limits to be able to, you know, know when to at least walk away from the evening and and obviously be able to, I don't know who they delegate to, obviously <laughs> more junior, they're, they're doing the work, but how do you help them understand this? Like this seems like if not, they could easily burn out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I literally tell them what I told you before. You know, it's not the end of the world. We're doing our best. You're doing your job while someone else is not, all right? They don't necessarily need to delegate to other people, but they do have peers. They do have superiors that they can kind of do that balancing act that I talked about before. So just the fact that you have more than one person, more than yourself, it doesn't matter if they're junior or senior, you know, we're all people at that point. To get that different perspective, to get that individual experience and calibration, I think is really the key. And I try to emphasize it. Look, it's not like you're trying to jump in front of a bullet here and save the president or something like that. You know, we're in security, but not that kind of security. So, you know, getting a good sense of reality and understanding of priorities and the fact that if you do burn yourself out, you're doing harm twice. First, to yourself, all right? And we don't want to have that. Second is to the business. You're not going to be able to do your job properly if you work 10, 15, 20-hour days, okay? You're going to be much less effective. I try to force myself to take breaks during the day just to decompress and do something else, take a walk, listen to a podcast, just kind of tune out of security, watch a quick episode of like something stupid on Netflix, whatever it is. It really allows me to get back into work and pick something up with a different perspective, with a little more gusto than I had before because I was just at it for four or five hours straight. And giving those examples and encouraging people to do take breaks, encouraging people to take their PTOs and take vacations. We actually have a concept at uh, Simpris. It's called the break. For every five years that, I mean, yes, you have to work five years, but every five years of employment at Simpris's companies, you have to take one month off, fully paid, just relax, you know, come back fresh and go at it for another five years. So, you know, it, it's those little things that uh, I really put a focus on and making sure that people do take that time off. I'm trying not to communicate during times that people are expected to be off. So very cognizant of what people's time zones are. Is this a holiday in their country? 
you know, is this a weekend? It's very easy to get sucked into this cadence of work and it's never ending. So trying to be an example myself and say, you know what, I'm not going to respond to emails in that time of the night. I know I can, and it might be super interesting. I was like, ah, I just want to get into it, but I'm not going to. It's okay. I can push it back for tomorrow, or I can wait until the end of the weekend and get back to it on Monday. That's definitely part of it. And hopefully that also gives the more junior people a sign or signal that says, you know what? It's all right. If Ian does it, and if my manager does it, and if someone else does it, it's okay for me to do it as well. And Ian's not just talking about it, he's actually practicing it. Absolutely. And I guess this is in the context of you're working and, and obviously you're grinding, you're trying to get you know solutions out. Let's talk about for a second when something goes wrong. So obviously, you know, sometimes depending on the security issues, it's pretty public. Like, I mean, you know, depending on if you're a big company, small company, I mean, you hear it on the news all the time. There's got to be a, a mental health component of when that news comes out and you know, it's like, oh crap, it's my team or, oh man, that was me. Like, I mean, you know, people can probably trace this back to people on the team where, and, and obviously maybe you can't, right? Maybe you can't pinpoint it, but you know, it's your team, you know, you're responsible for security. How does that play out in people's minds? Or maybe in your mind to start with. I can only attest on my mind and I know I might be a little weird here, but this is sort of what we're practicing to face at the end of the day. You know, this is kind of the money time. Personally, I get excited. It's like I, I feel at my peak when there's a crisis, when there's an incident, when something needs to happen, when I need to start coordinating between everyone from marketing to PR, to investor relations, to legal, to privacy, to security, operations, finance. I love it. You know, and I feel at my best in those times. So first of all, if you're not, this is probably not the job for you. <laughs> Second of all, again, going back to what I mentioned before, you need to understand that it's going to happen, all right? And it's okay to go through an incident. It's okay to make mistakes. It's even okay to make mistakes during the incident and during the communication, which is probably the most hurtful or potentially harming part because whatever you say, whatever you post or communicate out, is pretty much going to stay there forever. So first of all, super cognizant of, all right, we're in crisis mode. Everything that we do from now going forward that goes out externally is going to be on record, especially as a public company. You have to report it. There's a lot of regulations and, and requirements around it. So that kind of helps us, or at least myself, calibrate how I'm acting and, and what kind of communication style I'm using. The second one is, as I said before, we're all going to make mistakes. No one's perfect. Recognizing that and not giving that as an excuse, but recognizing that and saying, you know, following up on the previous X, we wanted to clarify that, you know, or we found out that actually the exposure was slightly bigger. It's okay to say that. It's okay to do it. Again, as long as you're not trying to hide something or be, you know, malicious with what you're doing in terms of that response, I think that that's the best path forward. I don't think that there's going to be a security professional who doesn't have at least one or two incidents under their name, so to speak. So I truly don't see that as, as a problem. It really boils down to me into how did you handle it? How did you handle yourself? And I sort of see it as bearing a badge of honor of, you know, it's like the Purple Heart. Yeah, you got hurt. They're giving medals for it in the military. <laughs> yeah, I think what's interesting you just talked about is being able to you know, understand the ramifications, being able to digest it, understand that it is part of the job. And I'm assuming, you know, people who get into it might have some glorifications of that because obviously Hollywood does a very good job of uh, glorifying security and hackers. And I think, you know, for lay people, there's a, maybe a misconception of some of this stuff, but it sounds like at least you've got a definitive process and you have a, your own kind of uh, track and methodology in terms of how to handle the mental health side. Yeah, definitely. And, and again, practicing makes perfect. You know, there's a lot of ways to simulate an event or a breach or an incident. I highly recommend going through it and going through it periodically to, again, to just remember that we do have a playbook. We do have a process. I do have peers and other people to consult with, to work with, to make sure that I'm following my playbook, to make sure that they're following their playbooks and we're all in sync here, even to a point of simulating a media interview. You know, you got to go live on TV, all right? The news are calling about the breach in company in Acme or whatever it is. 
Ian Amit, Chief Security Officer of Acme. What do you say to your consumers about this? Train for it. You know, it's not that difficult. There are actually places that would facilitate that with the spotlights, with kind of the, the equipment. These days, it's super easy to do. I highly recommend doing it because for every incident that you run through, you're just getting better. So if you can run through a few simulations of those incidents, you're just going to get better. And when that real incident comes in into play, you're going to start picking up cues from previous simulations and exercises. It's like, oh, yeah, I know, you know, I'm not going to fall into this again because I did this. I'm going to make sure that I've got legal looped in here because last time I didn't do it and they came in late. We botched up that process. So you're picking up all those cues and learnings from prior incidents and you're just getting better. I think that's great advice. I think if you're a company of any size, you know, if you're a startup of 50 people or you're a 50,000 person company, it makes sense to have a, have a playbook and have that simulation. Like you said, you're going to have to potentially rely on it. And it, the worst thing to do is it having been the first time when you actually has to count. So at least, you know, the repetition will help you kind of uh, at least know the steps to take. And, uh, you know, they always tell us in the airplanes, here are the exits and here are the slides. I'm sure, if, you know, shit hits the fan. We're all going to forget all that, but at least maybe you retain some of it. And that's why they repeat it every single time on a flight because they want that you know playbook and the simulation there for you. But uh, awesome, man. I think we're going to leave it on that note. We're uh, uh, some great advice. Thanks for being on and, and talking about this. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again. That was really cool. Absolutely, man. And uh, if anyone wants to follow up with Ian regarding anything that uh, you heard, we'll have his LinkedIn in the show notes. So feel free to reach out to him to pick up the conversation. And again, that's it for this episode. We'll be back again. Ask for two things. One is please uh, you know, subscribe to the podcast. That's the way it's been growing and it's been doing great. And the other is I love getting the topics of ideas of what you guys want to hear. I'll go find the guests to kind of match that up and hopefully keep providing value. Until next time, thanks. <laughs>